Azim, thank you. Um, I would like to shortly introduce uh, today's patient, um, and you will see in a couple of seconds that this is a very, very important case. It's a patient with a severe aortic stenosis, however unsuitable for transfemoral tower. So it's a female patient, 80 years old, and she suffers from severe emphysema. She's a current smoker, hypertension, and she has known severe aortic stenosis with a preserved ejection fraction and a rather small left ventricle. She lives independently and um, during normal life, uh, she suffers from shortness of breath on minimal exertion, New York Heart Association class three to four. She's unable to complete a complete sentence. However, she has no chest pain or syncope before. Here are the lab results. Um, you can um, see that we have an elevated anti-pro BNP of close to 1,000. Normal range would be below 400. We have a slightly reduced um, renal function. In the lower panel, you can see the ECG, which is um, unremarkable. Here's the echo um, finding. The peak gradient is 93 millimeters of mercury, mean gradient 56. So this results in an um, effective orifice area of 0.6 square centimeters. And again, patient had a good ejection fraction. She has a severe aortic stenosis, and importantly, it's a bicuspid valve with a preserved left ventricular function. Here's the angio, which is um, largely unremarkable, no stenosis to be treated. Again, right coronary angiogram. And here comes the CT. Um, I don't want to go too much into detail because we are discussing this a little bit later, um, but you can clearly see in the upper right panel uh, that we have a truly bicuspid valve. Upper left panel uh, nicely shows us um, the measurements and um, the parameter is 76 millimeters. Um, the average diameter is around 24 millimeters. Here are uh, the femoral arteries, and you can see um, that there are some stenosis here. And if you go into the measurements, we have a minimal diameter of 2.9 on the right side and 4.4 millimeters on the left side. The heart team discussion resulted in the following. It's an 80-year-old woman, woman with severe bicuspid aortic valve disease and worsening symptoms, New York Heart Association class three to four, despite maximal medical therapy. The risk score is in the intermediate range. A transcatheter approach is preferable due to the severe lung disease. However, the patient was deemed to be unsuitable for a transfemoral approach, and therefore the discussion started um, regarding the preferred access. The vascular surgeon um, considered um, a percutaneous intervention um, to be difficult due to the rather small anatomy of the transfemoral arteries. Um, the cardiothoracic surgeon um, was not so happy about a transapical or transaortic access due to the um, severe lung disease. Therefore, the heart team decision resulted in a um, transcaval tower procedure. Here are the key clinical data and angiographic references, which I just showed you. And now we come to the next point, namely the um, discussion of the imaging findings. Thank you, Hager. So we have a patient with severe aortic stenosis who was deemed unsuitable for transfemoral TAVI. And uh, Ronak, can you take us through the imaging? Okay, so let's dive a little bit depth into the imaging. So we know that this patient has severe bicuspid valve aortic stenosis with a peak gradient of 93 millimeters of mercury and a mean gradient of 60 millimeters of mercury, giving an effective valve orifice area of approximately 0.5 centimeters squared. So what we're going to do over the next five minutes is to give you a real-time CT analysis of this specific case. We're going to first of all look at the raw data followed by measurements of the annulus, the root, the ascending aorta, do some adverse feature analysis, abdominal aorta assessment, and peripheral vessels in terms of calcification, stenosis, and tortuosity. At the end of the imaging presentation, I'll also give you a technical summary and also my impression of the technical difficulty based upon the imaging analysis. 
So this is the Axial CT data set. As the image scrolls down, you can see some aortic arch calcification, normal main pulmonary artery, no thrombus in the left atrial appendage, dilated left atrium, left ventricular hypertrophy, calcified aortic valve. Normal liver, normal spleen, normal left kidney, normal right kidney, normal celiac trunk, normal superior mesenteric artery, normal right renal artery, normal left renal artery, normal inferior mesenteric artery, and we're now moving down to the common aortic bifurcation. And we can see that both vessels, the right side and the left side, are of small vessel caliber, and there's also some diffuse calcification on both the right and the left-hand side. As we move through, we've now localized the basal annulus ring. We can see that this is largely circular, with some mild basal annulus ring calcification. The annulus was derived at 453 millimeters squared, which gave an average diameter of 24 millimeters, a perimeter-derived diameter of 24.2 millimeters, and an eccentricity index of 4%. This was a bicuspid valve with no RAFE identified with a normal sinus of Valsalva measurement. These are the fluoroscopic projections in terms of cath lab angles that we provide to our interventional cardiologists to help guide the procedure during the TAVI deployment. And we can see that we've identified the basal annulus plane to make sure that this is aligned with the fluoroscopic projections. The left coronary osteal height was normal. It was 13.7 millimeters, so no concern regarding osteal occlusion of either the left or the right coronary height, which is 15.3 millimeters. The sinotubular junction was normal in diameter, although the ascending aorta was dilated at approximately 41.1 millimeters by 41.7 millimeters. These are cinematic volume rendered images of the aortic root anatomy along with the heart to provide a better depiction of the cardiac anatomy and the aortic root to our interventional cardiologists. We're now going to move on to look at the peripheral vasculature evaluation. So we're now looking at transfemoral access evaluation. This is the volume rendered image. And the next image is the volume rendered image with all of the bones and the pelvis taken away. We can start to appreciate that there is a significant stenosis of the right external iliac artery and diffuse calcification both along the right side and also the left side. When we did some systematic evaluation of the right external iliac and the left external iliac vessels, we noted that these were generally of small vessel caliber, and at that tight right external artery, we saw a partially calcified plaque which gave a vessel diameter of approximately three millimeters. We then systematically looked at the left-hand side, and we can see once again there is minor calcification throughout the vessel course, but the main concern with this vessel is that the diameter is approximately four to five millimeters. So my impression at this point of view is that transfemoral access would be technically quite difficult, and there is a, vis a risk of vascular injury if transfemoral access was applied. We're now going to look at some cinematic volume rendering of the peripheral vasculature, and we can see here a slightly better depiction. This is high definition, 4K resolution of the peripheral vasculature, and we're now considering this patient's case for a transcaval approach. So we're going to be focusing really on the infrarenal abdominal aorta and looking for sites of calcification and a calcification-free zone to make the transcaval puncture through the IVC into the infrarenal abdominal aorta. We we'll also have to pay particularly note to the great vessels that come off the abdominal aorta, and in particular, the celiac trunk, the superior mesenteric artery, and the renal arteries. We've localized the optimal crossing point to be at L2.4. And we can see that by doing this, we can also identify the optimal fluoroscopic projections, REO20 and LAO70 for this particular case, to give a close approximation to the IVC to the aorta, and also the on-fast view. Here, we're now starting to analyze the case in terms of a safety and bailout strategy. And to do this, we have to look at the aortic dimensions, 30 millimeters above the crossing point, 30 millimeters below the crossing point, and also look at the height of the right and left renal arteries. Here, we're also looking at the height to bifurcation. So should there be an issue with the transaortic puncture, we need to have a safe and effective bailout strategy in terms of a covered stent deployment. This is a wide MIP maximal intensity projection, which is portraying the iliac crests in relation to the great vessels to provide some on-site guidance to our interventional cardiologists as the optimal crossing point. We're now also measuring the target point of access from the transcaval access to the point to guide us in terms of the sheath length 
um, that's going to be used for the procedure. This is the overall summary of the case. Uh, the main recommendation is that this case is feasible, not favorable, and the main concern was the proximity to the left renal artery of less than 15 millimeters. Our optimal target site at entry is going to be L2.4, and we've also provided a bailout strategy in terms of the recommended stent to our interventional cardiologist should something awry happen. So my overall summary is that this patient is suitable for transaortic valve replacement therapy. There's no specific adverse features of the aortic route in terms of the coronary osteal height, annulus calcification, tortuosity, aorta, or femorals. My own personal opinion is that this case is unsuitable for femoral access by conventional standards, and the transcaval planning requires multiple steps in looking at suitability, safety, guidance, and the equipment required during the procedure in terms of bailout strategy. My overall impression is that, based on an imaging-guided technical difficulty level, I would grade this as being moderate, because it is a favorable, uh, uh, a feasible case for a transcable uh, TAVI procedure. Thank you very much. Bernard, can you hear us? Helga, good morning. We hear you very clearly. Good morning, Bernard. Good morning. Welcome, everyone, in the main arena here to so everybody... Um, Cath Lab 1 here at St. Thomas's. It's a great place. Go ahead. <laughs> we have a slight time lag, Helga. I'll keep talking if that's OK. So welcome to everyone in the main arena here to Cath Lab 1 at St. Thomas's Hospital. I'm surrounded by the extended uh, heart team here in, in the, the Cath Lab. And as you've gathered, we are planning an intervention by means of TAVI in a patient with complex and challenging transfemoral access. If I could see the first slide, please, and the next, and the next. So you've heard the presentation from uh, Helga with regard to the case, and what we aim to achieve over the next hour or so in your company is to demonstrate a transcaval TAVI procedure. In doing so, we hope to illustrate the key steps to ensure that this is undertaken in a safe and planned and controlled fashion. And we will particularly emphasize the importance of pre-procedural imaging in the workup of this patient to define the anatomical interaction of the inferior vena cava and the aorta to ensure the safety, firstly, of the crossing, the puncture, between the two major vessels, and subsequently, after the valve implantation, of safe fistula closure. And in doing so, we hope to demonstrate to you the, the potential patients who may benefit from this further alternative mode of TAVI access and demonstrate that it is feasible and safe in carefully selected patients when undertaken by an expert heart team. So you've already heard the details of the case. To recap very briefly, an 80-year-old lady with a bicuspid aortic valve, which is now severely stenosed and associated with significant symptoms in the presence of significant severe coexistent lung disease. She's now in NYHA class three or four, despite good medical therapy, with high risks for conventional surgery. And we've already explored the alternative modes of access by means of transfemoral approach, precluded by very small vessels, and an alternative transapical or transaortic approach, which would carry the need for general anesthesia and associated high risk. Next slide. So just to illustrate briefly the key steps that we will be demonstrating for you uh, uh, in the main arena today. The first step, A, is uh, obtaining vascular access and ensuring preparation and anatomical landmarking to ensure the correct crossing point from the IVC to the aorta. The second is the puncture, which we will explain shortly, followed by implantation of the TAVI valve, and subsequently followed by closure of the aortocaval fistula. And there are key procedural steps at each stage. The vascular access is via left femoral artery and right femoral vein, with guiding catheters in the aorta and the IVC guided by the pre-procedural CT analysis that you've already seen demonstrated by Dr. Rajani. And we'll be using orthogonal views to determine the accuracy of that positioning. We then cross from the IVC to the aorta using a series of microcatheters that will be demonstrated for you 
and electrocautery to create the passage from one vessel to another. We then implant the valve in routine fashion, and if time allows, we will also demonstrate for you the closure of the aortocaval fistula using a septal occluder device and final angiography. A few words of reassurance about the, retro the physiology of the retroperitoneal space. There is clearly concern that the creation of a fistula between the two major vessels could be associated with catastrophic retroperitoneal hemorrhage. In fact, physiology is designed for this procedure because the pressure in the retroperitoneal space exceeds that in the inferior vena cava. So even in the presence of a, a patent communication, there will be automatic flow from the aorta into the IVC thereby sparing the retroperitoneal space itself. Next slide. So we have an extended team here today, and it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Jafar Khan. Jafar is one of our former fellows here at St. Thomas's Hospital, and he's now working at the NIH, where the transcaval procedure has been developed. We're assisted by Tiffany Patterson, one of our excellent fellows currently. We have an extended catheter lab team including anesthesiologists, nurses, physiologists, and radiographers. And finally, a word of thanks to the team at NIH, Robert Lederman, Adam Greenbaum, Vasilis Bavalerios, Jafar, and Toby Rogers, who is with you on the panel, who have been instrumental and very supportive in helping us develop the cable program here at Thomas's. So I'm going to hand over now to Simon Redwood, who's going to be the principal operator for this case, and Simon, could you just uh, explain the setup of the patient uh, before we proceed any further? Sure. So if, you, if we could see uh, maybe a view from above, just so you can see where we're at at the moment. Uh, we have two eight French sheaths in, eight French in the left femoral artery, and through that there's a six French right Judkins guide catheter. Left femoral vein, um, we have an eight French sheath. I've put one proglide in, you'll see here. And through that, we have a six French uh, IMA guide catheter, short IMA guide catheter. And at the moment, they're positioned just about where we want to cross. I know you've, you've talked through the CT, so you probably saw that I think on the CT it was saying 2.4 to cross. We're actually going to cross a tiny bit lower than that, probably about 2.6. Is that right, Jafar? Yeah, I think that's right. <coughs> Do you want to explain that anatomical classification again, just to reiterate very briefly for the main arena, Jafar? Of course. So <clears throat> the classification, the middle of the vertebral body by convention is um, O. So the middle of the third vertebral body would be 3.0. And then the intervertebral disc between the third and the fourth would be 3.5. So um, there, in this particular patient, there's a large calcium-free window. Calcium isn't a particular issue. However, there is some bowel anteriorly. Um, and so what we want to do is approach this from uh, uh, sort of rotating the crossing catheter posteriorly and sweeping round to the middle, which we'll show you shortly. We've, done a, we've just done an aortogram. If you want to, if we go back one just to show the... So that's the root shot. We go back one more. So over here in the middle of the screen, that's the L3 vertebra. And the way to correspond this, map this out in your head, is you look at the top of the iliac crests and move inwards. And that normally correlates to the uh, L4-5 interdisc space. Uh, and it does on this, uh, this lady, and we, we confirmed that on CT. There's a slight bulge, which you can see at the top of L3, and that is where we're going to uh, target. So, so I'll just show you the live angiogram. <coughs> I don't know how well that shows, but that's where we are now. So on the left-hand side of the screen is the right Judkin sitting in the vein. Um, you may not be able to see that very well, but you will in a minute when we introduce some equipment into it. And on the left-hand side of the screen is the... Uh, Judkin, sorry, the IMA is in the, in the vein, is the Judkins in the artery. And it's roughly that sort of point that we're going to cross. The first step now is to introduce this Amplatz gooseneck snare. It's a 25 gooseneck, which um, 
you just take one size above what the size of the aort is, the diameter of the aorta in this case was about 18. Uh, so 20 would be suitable, 25 is reasonable, just so you circumscribe the whole aorta. So when you cross, it sits very nicely. Uh, uh, Bernie, Bernie and Simon. Bernie and Simon, this is Paul. Yeah. Uh, may I ask you what is the pain level when you are actually uh, puncturing through this tissue? Do you have to put the patient into GA or what is the pain level? This is actually going to be done under a conscious... This is conscious... They do feel it, um, but this is going to be done under conscious sedation. So we usually give an extra... It's a little bit extra painkiller when we're about to do it. Yeah, exactly. So typically just a little bit of extra fentanyl or whatever you're using, yeah. just at the, the crossing point, it just makes the patient a little bit more comfortable. They do feel the burn otherwise. But there is no reason to put a patient to sleep for this procedure. The next... Unless they're restless and moving around, I guess. No. Yeah, I mean, I mean there's no yeah. transcaval reason to put them to sleep. Yeah. But there's lots of other reasons to put a tabby patient to sleep, but not specifically no. for the access. And do you repeat the aortography in the lateral position, or is it just, do you do that under fluoroscopy? Yeah, we're gonna, well, we're, no, we're going to do it RAO. We're going to do it again RAO, because the, the picture you saw a minute ago was actually a direct AP projection. And we take two angles. We don't need to repeat the actual angiogram in the lateral position. Uh, the angiogram is mostly to co-register in our minds what we see on, um, uh, on X-ray as to what we planned on, on CT. So, so Simon's got the crossing system uh, shown over here, and uh, it's a coaxial system of a 014 guide wire, which is the Astato guide wire. It's an Astato XS20 guide wire. It's got a 20 gram tip at the end, and that's inside an 014 microcatheter, which is a fine cross, which is inside an 035 catheter, which is a short navi cross catheter. And what we're going to do is we're going to send these across sequentially. Um, into the aorta. So we'll pull the astato just back into the tip of the fine cross and we'll feed that up uh, to where we're going to cross. Far, uh, can you only use that wire for crossing? Right. Okay, I can answer so that question if they're not hearing us. The, we, we used to use the Confianza Pro 12 um, and we actually used to amputate the tip of it to make it even stiffer. Um, the Astato XS20 just seems, you know, out of the box, seems to have the, the stiffness we require and also seems to have the electrical properties that work well to concentrate the charge at the tip. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So we're just at the tip now. I've just pulled it back so, a little bit. Great. So mm. we go live on Fluoro. That's and where so, we are now. Okay. okay. And now I'm going to... So you can see the Navicross is the first dot. I'm bringing the Astato guide wire up now. and palpating just there. OK, so what we're going to now do is everything's in position. We're going to move over to our lateral view, which is LAO 70, 70. and aim that into the center of the bullseye. The other, the other thing to say is that we've already given heparin intentionally. So you don't wait until after you've crossed. So wait till it's fully there. So it's pointing slightly posteriorly, so we're just going to rotate it ever so slightly to the center. Yeah. That's good. I like that. Well, why do you we're give about it? the right height as well. We're about the right height, but we'll double check in the AP RAO, position. Yeah. Yeah. And right. So let's go to RAO. Perhaps you can shortly explain why you give heparin right now. So it, it would be intuitive um, to not to give heparin at yeah, this I point, mean, um, but there's a absolutely. certain reason. For yeah, and, well, there's two reasons. One is we have a snare sitting in the aorta, and that can be thobogenic, and the tip of the wire, once it's been effectively, what you're doing is cauterizing across, cutting across, that becomes thombogenic as well. I think we're good to go. So we? we're a touch high, I think. Just drag it down a little bit. I think that's good. Let's check once more in the other view, and then if we're happy, we'll go for it. It'd be lovely to have a biplane, wouldn't it, to do this? Yes. So this, this, this is very simple in a biplane lab. 
Okay, Perfect. so if that's at 70, that looks good. Slightly posterior is fine we because want. I said yeah. we do have bowel anteriorly. Uh, so let's go back to the AP or the RA20 view and we'll cross in that view. So the back end of this wire is connected to a, to, to a Bovi pencil with hemostats. And that is on 50 pure cut. We don't want to coagulate blood. We just want to cut through. And um, what Paul or Tif Tiffany is going to do is just press the pure cut button for a leisurely second as we push the wire across into the aorta. OK, so the sequence of events will be we'll cine. I'll call the burn. I'll acquire it. You'll acquire it, and then uh, you burn for a second. All right? So all I'm doing is I'm holding everything in position. I'm doing nothing more. This is very much a, you know, it's a several-person procedure. OK, you ready? Yeah. Cine. Burn. Stop. OK. All right. Now, fluoro. So if we're across, it should buckle at the back end, which it does right there. So I'm going to leave it there, and Simon's going to snare that wire. So the trick to this is advancing the JR4 while simultaneously pulling it in so you don't lose that catheter. So now he's going to pull the snare back, and he's got it there. And now, before breaking it in, a good thing to do is to rotate the Ooh. catheter across. You just rotate it away. And this is important because you don't want that catheter diving through. So while he's doing that, I'm feeding wire. And we'll follow that all the way up to the arch. Can we just store that, please? OK, and then we're just going to follow up. So this is, you know, Jafar's advancing while I'm pushing. Just it over. Okay, that's pretty good there. All right. Okay. So now I'm going to fix the wire while Simon advances the, the two catheters across. So the first one to go across would be the fine cross catheter. Just pin the wire there. <coughs> so this was, this okay. was very impressive. So back down, going sorry, back, back down, down to the crossing point. Back down. Make sure you know so we're you back look. down to the crossing point, please. There, just there. OK, so now I'm going to advance. You've got the wire? Yeah. Helga, I suggest we just get the okay. microcatheters through, and then we can pause a little bit for any questions. I'm just bringing the microcatheter back. It had come back. It had come uh, back when we were advancing the, uh, the wire. So do you see that? I don't know if you saw that, the microcapture is now at the top, near the top of the, well, top third of the picture, top quarter of the picture. You yeah. see the tip of it there? Yeah, we can see it now with the cine. Hopefully that comes across. And now I'm just advancing it. He's going to send that all the way up, and then he'll, then I'll pin both the microcapture and the wire as and Simon twists the Navicross across, and it should be going right there, there right through the altar. And he's going to send that up. So now we're going to go back up to the top, Unsnare the wire. We'll just leave the microcatheter in, and that will give us access into the aorta to put a 035 Lundquist wire in. So push the snare out a bit more. I'm going to pull. That's great. So now we leave the Navicross up, which you can see on the screen, and everything else is coming out I'll now. Give you that, so you can see there clearly. There's an Navicross tip right in the middle of the screen. So if we go back down to the crossing position, you so can... So the next we need is the dilator, please. The lady, yeah. So as the Lundquist goes up, you probably see this straighten out right there. You see the tip of the Lundquist, please? Great. OK, great. Should we just pop the, let's just take the while we're at, yeah, I was going to say, and let's we'll take swap uh, this out for a picture. Exactly. So should we just take some questions regarding the crossing now? Jafar, is that okay yeah. with you? I think that's good. Perfect. Idea. So fire away, Azeem and, and uh, Helga, with any key questions. 
I just, I just wanted to, to mention it was impressively, or it looked impressively easy to, to cross from, from the Wayne to the Orta. Is it always that easy, or is uh, there sometimes more resistance? Uh, do you have to repeat this uh, the step um, sometimes? Most of yeah. the time it's that easy. Um, the, this, is, this is a nice case because the, the Orta isn't that calcified, so the window to cross was pretty large. Uh, sometimes you have quite a small window to cross, um, and so if you hit up against calcium on the wall, um, you know, the, the key is to then to stop and re-advance. One key learning point here is if you see the wire buckle in the aorta, you have to come off the bovie straight away because rather than a pinpoint 014 puncture, you can then get a laceration. So if you see the wire going across and you see a buckle, the person on the bovie should come off straight away. I think that's, that's mm. the key thing about the crossing. I, I a couple, though, that have been what is the power you use for the diatermia? If, if, if the anatomy is favorable, 50 it's watts, pure cut. What was watts. the, 50 sorry, watts, that. Cut. Yeah, 50 watts cut. So, Jafar? Might you might be worth mentioning, Simon, for example, that case we did together last week where you, we had to balloon uh, the communication to facilitate the passage of the catheters. Yeah, there's been a couple where there's quite a lot of calcium and we actually I had trouble snaring, so I passed the wire up without it being snared so it wasn't being held in position and I couldn't advance the fine cross or the navicross. So we ballooned with a 1.5, and then we need, even needed a 2.0 balloon before we could cross with everything. And eventually the BMW went up the hang on, water, didn't it? Hang on. So I think there was another question there. Yeah. Jafar, so what happens if you can't cross or you cross and you lose your, you can't snare the wire and you have to recross? Is there a risk um, of bleeding when you try and recross? If you've crossed just with a 014 puncture, um, it's usually okay. Ideally, I mean, if you can't snare the wire, um, you know, you want to make sure you're in the true lumen and not going up a, up a dissection plane. So Down to the crossing point, please. So if we go down to the crossing point. So, so if you've gone across say, yeah, and you're perfect. not sure you're in the true lumen, the safest thing is to, is to come out and recross. Um, and that 014 hole usually shouldn't be a problem. That ha having said that, the few cases where there has been a bit of bleeding afterwards is when the aorta has been peppered by, by multiple crossing points at different locations. So it is undesirable to recross. Um, Definitely okay, better so to spend now, your time getting the setting up the shot and crossing the once rather than, you know, multiple cross. Mm. I agree. So now I'm just going to cross uh, with the dilator. So if we can put the hemos up on screen, which it is, so we're just going to cross with the dilator. So that, that went very easily. And just to demonstrate, you know, when I take this dilator out, there will be a big fistula between the aorta and the IVC. Just watch the pressure here. So you, you will see a small drop in pressure. Um, no oh, change in pressure. Never, no. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, that's probably just respiration, actually. Yeah. But, but the point is that the, you know, the, the pressure doesn't collapse. Um, and I'll just do a... Oh, it's gone again. Uh, just going to do an aortogram. You can see there there's a clear fistula into the IVC. And it's not causing any hemodynamic problems. I think it's quite noticeable how calm you so are in the cath lab. The <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's midazolam. It's <laughs> good stuff. Um, so now we have the Edwards E sheath, and as Jafar was reminding me earlier, we cross with the side arm pointing upwards. And the reason we do that is it means that the expandable split is um, is is the to leading the, edge. Is, is the leading edge is to my left, so it's to the patient's yeah. left. So the leading edge sees less pressure, the trailing edge sees more pressure, so we don't want any mishaps with the split in the seam. And then that sheet's gone up pretty nicely. Tiny bit of resistance, but really nothing much. Right. Okay, so that's that. Now I'm just going to secure the sheath in position. Okay. 
So we're now going to step into routine tavi mode. Jafar's going to step away from the table and take a well-earned rest. Simon will get his rest later on at the end of the day. So as we uh, were discussing earlier, um, we're going to use an Edwards S3 uh, valve to deliver through this Edwards E-sheath. And we'll be doing that with pacing, hang on, hang on, don't take just pacing on the safari wire, which is another uh, additional step that we've uh, introduced to the protocol in the last uh, 12 months or so in, as a step towards further simplification of the TAVI protocol overall. Bernard, you, you're just mentioning uh, you're now going to the normal TAVI mode. Um, then perhaps it is the perfect time to discuss uh, the selection of the device because we are here not only handling with a difficult access but also uh, with a bicuspid um, valve. How come your valve selection here? So, um, I mean, that's a whole new topic and I, I don't want to confuse the educational discussion here, but clearly device selection for bicuspid valves is an important consideration. Dr. Rajani has uh, been outlining some of the principles uh, in his presentation regarding the, the morphology, the anatomy and the CT. The We've also had a lot of reassurance from uh, contemporary series, notably that from the group in Los Angeles, demonstrating that contemporary TAVI devices are appropriate for use in bicuspid valve anatomy. So in our experience, we've used the, uh, the Edwards S3 in a number of cases, but of course there's also equally reassuring information so from the Evolute the and even now the from the accurate valve in bicuspid valve anatomy. You know what we were, um, the, the aorta we took at the beginning. So, Upper. Bernard, Upper. as um, you start crossing the valve, I, I wonder if you'd be able to respond to some of the questions coming from the audience, uh, just based on what they saw in the puncture and the trans cable. Is that okay? Absolutely. And Jafar is still on microphone, so if it's, if it's in his specialist realm, we'll pass the question to him. Okay. Please go ahead. So the first one, Jafar, was, wouldn't it be easier to snare the crossing wire from the radial access and then pull it back up, rather than from the femoral? Yes, but the reason we go from the femoral is that we're always thinking the about bailout. what the bailout will be. So the bailout, if your device closure with the ADO1 doesn't work, is all endovascular. Um, and the first step would be to put up a balloon, um, and it, that mm. depends on the size of the aorta. So in this case, the aorta is about 18 millimeters at the crossing point. So we'd go with a 22 Tyshak balloon, or we could use um, an ASO sizing balloon. They, both, uh, they will both go through eight French sheets. The Tyshak will go through a seven French sheet. So that's the first step, and you can get a seven or eight French in the radial. But the next step, uh, if that doesn't work, is um, a covered stent. And so you can't deliver a covered stent from the radial artery. If there was no, absolutely no femoral artery access at all, you'd have to consent the patient to say, we're going to do transcable access, but we have no percutaneous bailout options. Um, and I think that, you know, I think that is, uh, that's not a position you'd want to, anyone would want to be in, certainly during their first uh, couple of dozen cases. Have you, <clears throat> have you ever used IVUS to help visualize your crossing? Here's another question from the audience. I haven't, Toby. Uh, we've, I've never used it uh, for, from a sort of clinical procedural step. I'm aware of a couple of people who've done it purely for sort of academic okay. interest. I don't think it adds much to the crossing. It can be done entirely fluoroscopically, but it's, you know, it's always interesting to see a different image of a, of a shunt. And people have looked with uh, surface echo and ultrasound as well to look at, evaluate fistula at the end of the case. But again, I think most of this is, is, is fluoroscopic guidance. Obviously, there's some concerns about retroperitoneal bleeding. Um, and is there any way to check for bleeding in the aorta after the puncture? For example, do you do repeat angiography or do you just evaluate the patient clinically? Is another question from the audience. I mean, if I answer that question, so, so long as the sheath is we through, yeah, there, is, there is no bleeding. It's like the proverbial finger in the hole in the dam. You know, when, when we come to the closure, there will be blood crossing. But I think they've already demonstrated that with that little injection earlier to show that 
any blood that's leaving the aorta is going back into the IVC, and that's the principle that we rely on. Uh, you know, that the, the blood will remain intravascular rather than collecting in the retroperitoneum. There is one more question. Um, is uh, this technique feasible also yeah, with yeah. a valve system without a sheath, such a valve with an inline sheath? Um, the simple answer is yes, because you can yes, always find so a sheath that it will go done. through. And so you should just upsize your sheath if you're using a, an evolute system. And you can also system, you do can it upsize. sheathless. Uh, and, and it's also worth pointing out that so you know, transcable uh, is useful for other things as now. well. Thanks, Bernard. Let's, so we're let's... moving on now with the, uh, the pacing setup. Simon, can you just quickly talk us through the setup of pacing on the left ventricular wire? So we've got the, a, a small safari wire in the ventricle now, um, and that's what we're pacing over. We've got the red connector connected to a green needle, which is just through the skin here by the venous puncture site. And once we're up with the device, that device will effectively insulate this wire uh, and we'll connect up the black connector onto the wire then and, um, and paste through the wire. So we just pace at about between 15 and 18 volts. Okay, we're happy with the valve sizing, Simon. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so 26 millimeter Edwards S3. I'll just highlight for you the fact that um, presented at this meeting actually is one of the uh, leading abstracts is a randomized control trial evaluating conventional right ventricular pacing using a temporary wire with this technique of pacing on the left ventricular safari. So look out for the results of that study, which will be presented in the next day or two. Um, can we just put the aortogram up there, please, on the right? No, next. That's it. Thank you. Just wanted to change my reference view. Okay, I'm just going to check the wire is still on the ventricle. Come a little bit Back higher, up to please. the heart and stay on the heart, please. That's it, just there. Okay, so I'm just introducing the valve now. There. There's a lot of noise in the background, guys, if that's any way that can. Okay, so I'm just going to load the valve on the balloon. Is it your usual practice to not predilate in this uh, bicuspid anatomy when you're using a balloon expandable valve? Uh, yes, bottom line. Um, we'll find out if that's a mistake in a minute, if I can't cross. And stay where you are, please. It's not a particularly heavily calcified set of valve leaflets, Helga, so we're very confident that this valve will cross. Ooh. Okay. Connector on yep. there, please. Have to check the pacing, Simon? No. You're happy. Um, we're at our deployment view. Team dynamics are fine. Hold that wire. You've got the wire. I'm just going to cross now. Withdraw the pusher to the middle of those three markers. Watch your wire. What do you think, Simon? Is it gone a little bit there. deep? Yeah, I'm just, um, just withdrawing the pusher so it would have done. Okay. Thanks. <coughs> it's not far off. I mean, I, I we, 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 work very closely together, obviously, and Bernard will be doing a slow inflation so I can reposition as needed while we're inflating. Um, it's a millimetre too low, side. I think it is. I think yeah. it is. But So rather than just pull on the device, we're going to push on the wire because we want the wire touching the ventricle. I'll do that for you now. Okay, there. That's lifted it by that millimetre, hasn't it? Yeah, probably. I think that's good. So we're going to deploy it about there. I'll reposition if necessary while we're inflating. I'll start off by just, when we start, once we're pacing, I'll do a quick aortogram just to okay. check the position and then we'll carry on. Okay. So, are you ready for pacing? Yeah. Okay. So, pacing on, 180. That's good. 
That's good. Start there. Okay. Going there. Slowly. Keep going. Slowly. Keep going. Okay, all the way up. All in. And down. And pacing off. I'm just going <coughs> to just undo that. Easy. Back to normal rhythm. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Another. Yeah, it's on negative. There you are. Yeah, come down now. Okay, I'm coming back. Yep. Let me get this out of the camera. Just find the orthogonal projection, Jules. Okay. So let's just see that valve side on. Just see the valve side on, please. Yeah. No, it's going to be cranial or cordal, not uh, probably a bit more cordal. It's because she's um, slightly upright on a wedge. But that's pretty good. You just go a little bit of LAO. Just yeah, back to the LAO. A little bit of LAO as we had. The normal view is more caudal, please. There, we're getting there. Keep going. Maybe that. There. That's it. Okay. okay. You ready? Yep. I need to place her late there, I might not. Just pull the wire back a little bit, what do you think? Yeah, that looks like it's not all... Nah, in the. Central. That looks like it's none of that, some of that's paravalva. What do you think, Helga? Yeah? First, first impression was oh, that there is yeah. some regurg. Ready? It may be yeah, due yeah, to yeah, the yeah. wire, so per perhaps you could put uh, put in a pigtail. So oh, that's better. Yeah. Much better. Is it? Very oh, central. Mother. There so it's go. an important teaching point that the, the, the wire was actually splinting one of the leaflets, causing that m rather more significant AR with the first shot. But just pulling the wire back and centralising it Looks a lot less has there. made a substantial difference. And I think that positioning is OK. The positioning is perfect. It's nice and high. I mean, it's got nice one cell just below the annular plane. It's perfect. Question is, do we need be to post to, light it? Well, it'll be easy to recross. Why don't we take it out and do another aerogram? And then if there's any doubt, we can do an echo. So let's pull this out. Okay. We can just recross with a pigtail okay. if we need to. So can we ask whether okay. Victor let's Kelly is available to do an echo Kelly. if we want one? Kelly Victor. Uh, Anna, may I make a question regarding the pacing wire? Can you do this pacing only with the safari wire or no. even with the Amplatz Extra Stiff? You might need it again. You can do it, Yolinda, you can do it with any wire. So we've, we've done it even during balloon valvular plasty. We've done the same uh, on an Amplatz Extra Stiff as you describe. We've not personally done it on the Cofida, but I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to. Um. So what's, the, I think that looks what's your view, me. Simon, first of all? You're looking after the patient, but what's the view of the panel also regarding this mild paravalvular aortic regurgitation? Could we see the it's last aortogram again? Um, I'd be tempted to leave that. Can we replay last the last aortogram? Yes? So I think that... The next view, I think it looks pretty good. We would measure hemos. I mean, we would typically do that as our, if we don't have good TE for whatever reason, I think we rely upon the hemos uh, at this point. And then? For me, this is less than one, view? so yeah, you don't need to do anything view? else. Yeah. And you see how much calcification is there. So if you do a post dilation, the risk of rupture in this case will be very high. And it is not hemodynamically relevant, this kind of uh, regurgitation less than one. Yeah. Satisfy. Okay. I don't want to. want to please Jeff. <laughs> Thank you. Are you going to give us hemodynamics? Power <laughs> yeah. I just want to make sure I cross in the valve and not around it, but I don't think we will. So. It looks great. It looks very nice. See, this is my fault. So, Taking Jeff, uh, as far as the hemodynamics, mm -hmm. what, what do you look at? Just the diastolic pressure? Do you look at the AR index? So we don't use the AR index because that's very heart rate dependent. But certainly, ha we, we would compare the LB-EDP before and after. Science. And we yeah. make sure that it doesn't raise by 10. And we look for the difference. 
between the LBEDP and the aortic diastolic pressure and the contour of the LBEDP at the end diastolic. So it's really for questionable cases. I have to say 90 percent of the time it doesn't really make much of a difference. But it's easy to do. I'm going to leave it for now. What we're going to do, in fact, is um, we can leave this. We can put the connect this back up. So we've got. Um, is we're going to give. We, we finished. So we finished the, the TAVI procedure. A little flush. We're going to give prosamine now, and the reason for doing that is that we need the prosamine to be working before we put the duct occluder in. Um, and that takes 10 minutes. So if we give the prosamine now, then we've got 10 minutes pause while we talk. Yeah, so to conclude this section, and as it were, we've got mild paravalvular aortic regurgitation. It's not the easiest valve to recross with these large sinuses. And Simon very reasonably feels that there may be Just some... Just for the moment, what we're going to do... Yeah, sorry to butt in. We, we're going to do echo while we're talking. So yeah. if we can move the camera out of the way, we're going to get a transthoracic echo, give protamine, do the transthoracic echo, chat about what we've done exactly. so far, and then, yeah. and then close the hole. So, Jafar, if you want to step in here, because I imagine what we're going to do, uh, Azim, is have a mini-react now in this 10-minute gap in the procedure... And Jafar's going to come in and join us again for any questions that relate to the, the trans-cable technique. It's great. So far away. We've got tons of questions from reacted PCR. Um, so let's go back to the trans-cable. Um, what is your target blood pressure during the procedure? Which camera are we on? This camera. We're on this camera. Yes, you are. Sorry, can you <laughs> say, say, say that again? What is your target blood pressure during the procedure? Uh, Protamine. Is there any concerns uh, about... We, I mean, we don't have one. Um, so, no, I... so, you know, it, it, it's interesting in surgery when they're operating on, on the aorta, they like to keep the, uh, the systemic blood pressures low, but that hasn't been standard teaching in, in transcavals. Maybe it should be, but we, you know, uh, in all the transcavals done so far, we haven't really lowered the blood pressure. The one problem about lowering the blood pressure artificially is that um, you, you, need, you need that as a marker to say, to indicate something's gone wrong. So, uh, so you want to see a drop in blood pressure and you want to react to that appropriately. Um, and I think that's one reason we don't artificially lower it, like, um, say, a, a vascular surgeon would if operating on the aorta. I wonder if I could just add something that we, um, one thing we don't want to do is, is to raise the blood pressure. And so we typically, during the closure, see the blood pressure drop a little bit, and we specifically ask our anesthesia team, please don't treat it, because otherwise you end up with a systolic of 200, and you now have a hole in the aorta with a systolic of 200. So we, we do tolerate lower blood pressure during the procedure, but we don't necessarily give drugs to lower it for specifically. Sometimes we see after the TAVI procedure that you have a systolic blood pressure of 200 immediately. What do you do in this case? Uh, we would sit tight and... Often it will settle back down again. Not you know. actively lowering down. I, I've, I, I have never had to do that. It typically will settle down on its own, or you give a little bit more sedation or something. But I, I, yeah. Well, are, we, are we going to experience some uh, decrease in the diastolic pressure because of this uh, runoff in the in the aorta cable shunt? A lower you, diastolic pressure or...? Well, we typically see a drop of about 10 to 20% of the blood pressure generally, systolic and diastolic, during the closure. So once, now the sheath is across, there is no shunt. Once there is a shunt during the, during the closure, there will be a drop in the blood pressure. And that's what I see. We, we typically tolerate that. We try not to treat it. And then what we expect to see once the closure device is deployed is that the pressure will come back up to where we were once we closed the fistula. Far, another question was what Having type of... Having said that, the, the, the dilator, the... so just, just one point, um, the, you know, passing the dilator up first is, is a nice warning sign for, for the team and the anesthesia team just to, just to see if, you know, if the patient tolerates a shunt or not. And in this case, there was no particular change in blood pressure with five millimeter holes in uh, the aorta and the IVC. So... So I expect that we won't see a, a massive change, but, but we shall see. That's why it's nice doing that test um, straight up to show that. So can we just butt in there with the questions, because we've got some very nice echocardiography at the moment. If we could get a camera on the echo imaging... 
because that will reassure everybody in the main arena with regard to the aortic regurgitation. Uh, you've got that now on, on live screen imaging. So our uh, echo uh, technician, Kelly, is not microphoned up, but we can see here that she's getting some very nice windows and there is very trivial uh, aortic regurgitation. And I think we can be reassured that there's no need to postulate this valve. So let's park that question. And now let's go back to the, uh, the questions from the main arena. Thanks, Bernard. I think it does address one of the questions that came from the audience because a member of the audience mentioned that noticed that the diastolic blood pressure was low and was concerned about the AR. And I think the echo does respond to that. So thank you. It was perfect. So when you do a when you do a self-expanding evolute, do you put a 20 French sheath in, or do you do the normal exchanges with the inline delivery system? We would we would uh, if it's an you R, we would use an 18 the French. Most common ways to put the sheath in. Yeah. Question regarding the heparin dosage. Sorry, go ahead, Toby. How much heparin did you give? We normally. We we gave 5,000. Uh, that didn't get the ACT high enough, and we gave another, was it another five you gave? Or, yeah, another five. So he, she had a total of 10,000 of heparin, and we achieved the same ACT as if we're doing any TAVI procedure. So what is your target so ACT? 250 and 300. 250 to 300, okay. 250 to 300. I have a question for and in we've case. We've given the prosamine, we've got another five minutes. In case you need a, a bailout strategy to get and put to covered stent, given the fact uh, that you have a peripheral artery or disease. So how would you insert, for example, the big sheath or catheters for a covered stent? How do you go there? And how fast can you do it? We, we have an eight French arterial sheath on the left. So the first step is to uh, do balloon aortic tamponade. So, um, that just requires a seven French sheath for a 22 Tyshak balloon, um, three inflations of five minutes each. Um, so that's the first step. So that doesn't require huge arterial access. Then the next um, thing to do is look for a covered stent. And in our transcable manuscript, we've, uh, we've described a couple of stents, the ovation and the trivascular stents, uh, which are particularly low profile stents. Um, that we deliver bareback, um, but but when you're, you know, I think when once you get to that stage, it is it is emergency uh, bailout. Thankfully, we don't need to get to that. But but you know, instead of for you know, I mean, that is that is your that is your extreme emergency bailout, and and you just push it in. Um, I've had, I've had talking, one case with difficult access and we just put a balloon up from one end. side to, so that we were stable and then we did some work on oh, the other nice groin to get the, 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 uh, you know, the, the covered stent up. Can you use conventional covered stents or the aorta? Can we project the slide relating to the fistula, please? Perfect. Do you want to just speak to this slide, Jafar, while we've got the opportunity? Of course. So when we, when we put the plug in, we take, a, we take an immediate angiogram, then we take a final angiogram. And this on the, on the slide here just classifies uh, the four types of fistulas, um, the four types of closures that we see. Um, so type zero by convention, which is about a third of cases, uh, you see complete closure of that tract. And that's, of course, very reassuring. Type one you see a, a laminar fistula going straight from the aorta through to the IBC. And type 2 is also a fistula, but you see some swirling just outside the device. But importantly, it all decompresses into the IBC. So type 1 and type 2 are the fistulas, and those are the most common presentations that you will see at closure. The only one to really worry about is type 3, which in our, in our series of prospective uh, 100, uh, 100 patients studied prospectively happened in 1% of cases. And that's when you see blood into the retroperitoneal space, not decompressing into the IBC. Um, so that is when you need to get ready with balloon aortic tamponade and have your team ready and prepare the, uh, the covered stent if balloon aortic tamponade doesn't uh, doesn't close that up. And a few words about long-term follow-up of the of types one and two, particularly. 
So we've, um, we've analyzed the one-year follow-up uh, with CTs on, on all these patients, and those results will be presented in, uh, in a couple of weeks' time at TCT. Um, but of the patients who had CTs um, uh, and had fistulas, in, in, a, in a year's time, around 95% of them close off. Um, uh, with about uh, just over 80% closing off at 30 days. So that's, that's the general trend of what happens to those fistulas. So Azim, Helga, I think we've probably got time for one more question before we move on we to the conclusion. Actually, please. Yeah. Thank you. There was one question um, from a very technical point of view, um, namely that you just repeat the sequence of the puncture, which material in which sequence um, uh, comes into play? It was so easy no. <laughs> that, Use, that it was too fast, um, obviously. Yeah, no, that, that's... So the, <clears throat> the guide wire, uh, which is on the inside, perfect. So on the slide, so number one points to the guide wire. Uh, and these days, we just use an 014-inch Astato XS20 guide wire by Asahi. It has a 20-gram tip, commonly used for peripheral CTO work. That is sheathed inside an 014 microcatheter. Uh, there are a number available. The most commonly used are either a piggyback microcatheter or a fine cross. We, today, we used a fine cross. That system is then inside a 035 um, microcatheter, and this needs to be a short microcatheter, and the commonly, we commonly just use a Navi cross for that. And that whole system is inside the crossing, uh, the guiding uh, catheter, and today we used uh, a short IM guiding catheter. And so it's a series of coaxial catheters. Wire goes across first, then the fine cross, then the Navi cross. Once the Navi cross is in, you take the Astato and the microcatheter out and send a Lundquist wire up, then you have access to put your sheath in. And this is important because if we, when we, once we come to closure, we'll have a safety wire up, just use a long BMW wire. In case we have pulled through, then we need to repeat some of these steps, get a, get a catheter up, uh, we, can use, we can just go for either the Navi cross or just a multi-purpose catheter, re-enter uh, re the aorta, get the Lundquist back in, put the sheath back up, and start again. So there is a safety element to, uh, to the risk of, of pull-through. Um, and I think perhaps later we can talk about some uh, dedicated devices in the pipeline, but maybe we should yeah. so have a look. We're here. now moving towards the septal occluder. I'm not sure how well we're going to be able to show this trolley. Are we able to get a camera on here? We can always bring it over. OK, want. here we go. That's perfect. Oh, actually, just, it just needs attaching. But... 125. Yeah. So the ACT is 125. So I think, Jafar, Simon, you're happy to move forward? Yeah. Yes. I Power down, great. please. So Jafar, quickly talk through no. the kit here not on the table. trolley, and then we can not get moving. Down, just power down. So this is an, uh, a first-generation Amplatz duct occluder, ADO-1. Uh, it's a 10-8 uh, duct occluder, and, and it's a standard uh, size yeah, for any TAVI sheath that you, TAVI sheath that you want to use. The, this is just the, uh, the, the cable that comes with it and the uh, introducer um, and, the, and the introducer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to attach, attach the duct occluder to this wire. And so just gently, and then we're going to push that in as Paula injects through. So let's just close this up. Just move the, um, the bowl a bit forward, Jafar, so people can yeah. see. That's okay. it. Paula, just tilt the bowl for me as well. Yeah. Great. Perfect. Okay, now keep injecting. I'm just going to pull that in. Okay, good. That's good. All right. So you don't take the end off at first? No. So what we're now going to do is... And now you take it off. We need to introduce this into a small curl agilis sheath 
which Simon's going to introduce now over an e um, O32 wire um, <clears throat> in through the trans cable tract. So to get this into the back of the hub, we need to get rid of this screw top, which we just cut with a scalpel. If you want to be now. fancy about it, you can make Let's a slightly beveled sheet, look, and you've got to be careful not to cut, obviously Perfect. cut the device. <clears throat> so give that another flush, please. So we go back down to where. Yeah, I've just got some tip of the sheet. Bread. So just put this um, three way on the back and just flush it and then lock it. Okay, a few bubbles coming. That's good. Okay, great. So we'll go on to the main table and to the overhead camera now. So what I've done is I've taken a um, BMW and put that up into the arch just as a backup. So we always have access to the aorta in case we need it. Um, we've got the Agila sheath here with an 032 wire. That's going in now. And you can just see on the angio, the tip of the sheath. I'm just going to bring this up inside the sheath. Stop there. Perfect. And we'll take out the wire and the dilator. OK. OK, so if we can find where we Now we come down to the, yeah. And uh, we'll bring the pigtail to where that is. So I think it's a let's bit higher. zoom out. Let's I think it's perhaps a bit higher, please. Let's find the, uh, the crest. OK, so it looks like it's probably at the interspace in the middle of the screen there. We can take a little picture. OK, okay. so we know exactly where we crossed. Yeah, great. So we've got that right in the, just put that over to the right, please. And then we're going to pull the pigtail back so it's out of the way. So it's now just below. So now, this, this, takes, uh, this takes a couple of steps, and I'll just, uh, as Simon is doing it, I can, I can explain um, what he's doing. So he's, at the back end here, he's introduced that introducer into the back of the Agilis, and uh, I think it's a bit tight in mm. there. Um, and he's sending that Amplatz duct occluder up to the tip of the Agilis sheet. That's the first step. Then we're going to bring the whole thing back down, uh, the sheath and the agilis in tandem, just one disk space, so one disk space above where we, where we closed. And then we'll be ready for the, for the closing maneuvers, which we can talk through. So that's the ADO-1 coming up, and it's now at the tip of the agilis. Can you all see that? So next thing I need is okay. a knife. Let's take this off. Yeah. And we specifically chose to deliver this through an nice, Agilis please. because it allows as much finer control of the orientation of the device than just using the Amplatz delivery system that, that will only deliver it in a single um, direction. We want to try and get this device as horizontal as possible to get the best possible apposition to the wall. You'll keep the safety BMW so up. Is that, is that in here right now? Just keep it up and then you trap, trap it through it. We oh, trap it, and once we're happy yeah. with the device uh, position, then we'll pull it out. But it's just there in case, if case you pull too hard, pull the device through, you always have access and you can always put a, 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 a catheter up again, exchange for your stiff wire and put a sheath back and you're back to square one for the closure. Obi, is this the only device you can use to close or can you use an AVB2? Okay, we, we have tried a number of different devices. Um, this one seems to work well. And it's, uh, you know, it's simple, one size fits pretty much every Tava sheath. The only reason to upsize is if you, you're doing a particularly larger sheath for something like a T-VAR or a five liter impeller or something like that. All right, Toby, I'm just gonna bring the Edwards sheath back. Uh, I'm holding the Agilis, I'm holding the BMW, and it's one quick maneuver across the fistula. Okay. Just to show you. So you can see the fistula there into the IVC. Um, Go ahead, so now. So you see that, I hope. And it's important to get the sheath 
all the way into the IBC because you don't want to block that off and our pressures are remaining good. So we're now going to expose the aortic uh, disc, as it were, of the uh, ADO1 device. And this is a small aorta, so it may be challenging bringing it back round. So you can bring the whole system in tandem down. If it looks like that's causing too much scraping, we can bulb the device, but that's coming down nicely. Now Simon will start to flex the agilis to make it horizontal to the aorta because, of course, we crossed in a horizontal manner. And once he is fully flexed and up against we just need to go the REO, wall, please. REO 20. if we square the device up, I'll send the pigtail just above it and we'll take a picture. So the device looks, we go a little bit, looks reasonably square there. Okay, ready for your run? What do you think, Simon? Maybe pull it back just a little bit. I'm going to, sorry, I'm just going to talk about it a little bit more. And just a little bit more, I think. Jules, if you can swing the camera so we square that device up. It's Probably a bit more area. Okay, let's take another picture there. Oh. I think that's up against Good. the wall. Yeah. So the thing we're looking at is to make sure that's up against the wall. So the next step is to extrude the neck. So what Simon's going to do is fix the device and withdraw the agilis as he's straightening it. Um, so he'll withdraw and unflex at the same time. that straightening up and then he'll form the device and pull the agilis back keeping the device in okay, okay. All, right. all right we'll take another picture that's good so there's nothing else we're going to do on the arterial side here um, so if you all agree on the panel we're going to release the device and we're going to pull the bmw wire um, pressures are stable, um, and then we're going to work on closing up the vein and take another um, DSA picture of that in another five minutes or so. Everyone happy with that plan? Jafar, is there still some residual shunt? Hope so. <laughs> and there is, will, yes. And it how looks long will like it take a, to uh, a type one shunt. Okay. There's almost always well, at this stage is, some shunt. We're not looking for immediate yeah. closure. We'll take the BMW out. So we'll take the BMW out. Not with these devices. We're going to take a picture in about five minutes, and, and I think you, you may well see a... So I think what we can do now is work on, work on closing the vein. We'll close up the vein, go on to DSA, um, and take another picture. So while Simon is working on that... Um, the table out, please. We can field any more questions. So Jafar, there's a question about um, residual leak. So the question is, if the if closure fails with a plug, does it make it harder for you to no, get no. sealing with a covered stent? Will there be a type of endo leak or a lack of apposition of the covered stent because you now have that device in the aorta? Okay. So top and bottom, That's yeah. an interesting question. The answer is I don't know. Um, usually when we put, a, put the covered stents in, there is some uh, a type 2 okay. ender leak initially, um, and that often seals up within the cath lab. So if we put a covered stent in, we usually won't send the patient away with a fistula. We'd want to, we'd want to see that closed up. Toby, what's been your experience with that? I think this is a good time to answer the question you asked me earlier and I didn't get a chance to respond to, which was what type of cover stent to use. And there's, cover stents are not all the same. Um, I think the key here is to use a self-expanding cover stent, not balloon expandable, because you really want something that's going to you know, oppose these yeah. very irregular shaped aortas. Uh, and our preferred devices are iliac limb extenders of AAA devices. Um, 
the uh, endologics in particular has the material on the outside which just seems to sort of seal very well over Amplast okay, devices. Okay, so, you know, we have a number of preferred devices that seem to work best and, and we strongly advise people not to just use, you know, their typical covered stent that they have on the shelf and to, to use the ones that we have the most experience with. And what sizes of covered stents are you looking at? So again, RONAC showed us the pre-procedural CT planning and we never go into one of these cases without knowing exactly what size covered stent we need based on the CT and so we just use typical sort of at least 10% oversizing uh, covered stent for, for, with the self-expanding device. Obi, when you leave this kind of uh, minor fistula <laughs> the day after, do you have decreased hemoglobin or it doesn't so, if it, so long as there's a fistula like this and it's not extravasation to retroperitoneum, the blood is still intravascular. So um, these are tolerated by almost all patients. Wow. There is a small subset of patients with really bad uh, biventricular, particularly right ventricular function, who don't like the fistula. And so I've had one or two patients where, although I was confident there wasn't bleeding, the patient didn't like the fistula or didn't like the left to right shunt. And so okay. in that scenario, we would take a balloon up and do balloon tamponade and try and occlude the fistula on the table. Even though I think it's safe from a bleeding perspective, it's just not tolerated. But that's a very small proportion of patients with really bad RV function who don't like it. You know, we have a lot of patients walking around with AV fistulas and they're all fine. So most patients okay. will tolerate it just, just, just fine. There is one question. When can you reassess uh, the aorta? Any fear of dislodgement of, of the um, device? No, that device isn't going anywhere. And what happened um, in, in case of a redo procedure? So if there are any problems with the valve or you have to come to, to, to the aortic valve, can you do it a second time? Uh, so theoretically, if there's another you good target in the aorta to cross, the target. truth is a lot of these patients don't have um, you know, many locations to cross because they have calcified aortas. So it's entirely dependent on the patient's anatomy as to whether you can do it a second time. Okay. That's much better. Just press. Yeah, I could just put that seal in, couldn't we? We've got a bit of bleeding from the venous point, which surprises me actually because the um, proglide went in very easily. But let go there. Let's just put that in and press. I'm just going to put an anti seal in, slightly unconventional, but um, can I just get in there and put the anti seal in? Thanks. Of course, you have another uh, higher pressure in, on, on the venous side than just usual. Therefore, um, it Look might it just broke. be a little bit more difficult to close. Yeah, maybe. Got a press below as well. Yeah, it's oozing a bit, but have we got enough? We... So maybe it's time to do a DSA. Um, so tower down. No, on in if we square up the device. So the view we had was actually quite DSA. good. Wasn't it? That was quite a good view. Yeah. How far away was that? Do you remember? You're right there for the minute. Yeah. No, for the for the device you know, for the crossing. Yeah, but it was a bit more when we saw it side on, wasn't that? So down to the device. That's it. That's good. That's, that's good. good. That's, that's good. That's nice. And we, we want to set up DSA, please. Up a little bit, just so it's not firing straight in. So, Azim and Helga, just while we're setting up the DSA, is there time for uh, Jafar and Simon to go to the reactant PCR booth, or would you like to take more questions here in the cath lab? Well, we still have six and a half minutes, so I think yes. Um, we've got a few more minutes. Um, it may just be best to do it where you are. Um, I worry, yep. That's beautiful. Yeah, I don't know if you, you can Type see zero that DSA. Closure. First of all, I think this is uh, the time for applause. Very, very convincing result here. It's an incredible result. So should we go and go to the react and... They're um, asking that we stay here. Oh, we stay here. Sorry, I missed minutes. that. I missed that. Yeah. So why don't we have the camera on Simon and Jafar, and I'll just look after the minor venous oozing, and you guys can take some questions. Yeah, there are a couple of questions, uh, especially concerning the uh, transcaval access, and... Um, most questions um, are about limitations. First question would be, is low left ventricular function a limitation for transcaval approach? And perhaps I can add, uh, how about the right ventricular function? No, not at all. No, not at all. 
As Toby mentioned, in some cases of severe biventricular failure, they don't tolerate the shunt, uh, but that can, be, that can be managed. So it's not been a contraindication. I guess the only contraindication is calcium all the way down the aorta. Correct. So if there's absolutely crossing, no window um, and there's a bowel full between, calcified aorta. Correct. Bowel between us, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's more or less it. The, the other thing is um, if you don't have uh, a convincing bailout option, so if there's uh, an occluded, um, you know, both femorals are occluded for whatever reason, there's no way you can use your bailout, that's, uh, that's <coughs> probably uh, advise against going transcapal in those cases. Questions also about if the IVC pressure is high or you have severe tricuspid regurgitation, does that increase bleeding? That's a good question. Um, just by default, the retroperitoneal pressure will always be higher than the IVC pressure. Otherwise, you just ooze out and bloat out like a balloon. So even in very high IVC pressures, the physiology will still hold. The retroperitoneal space will be higher than the IVC pressure. And I think it's worth pointing out that they haven't closed the hole in the IVC. They've put a device in that only has a disc and only has material on the aortic side. So we deliberately leave the IVC hole open so that you know, we, want, we wait until the aortic side closes. Here it's not an issue, but if there is a persistent fistula, you want the fistula to remain patent. You do not want the IVC closing before the aorta. So we deliberately choose a device that doesn't have discs and materials and things on the IVC side. Uh, Toby, uh, if a patient has a a uh, history of abdominal surgery, would it change anything? I think I'd want to know what the surgery was, and it's true that you know we're relying on the principle that the retroperitoneal space is intact. If there was a potential communication between the retroperitoneum and the peritoneal space, then I would be more concerned because I wouldn't necessarily be able to rely on that physiology because you, the blood could decompress into a low pressure peritoneal space. So certainly I think I want to know what the surgery was, how long ago, and it would, you know, you would factor it into your decision making in terms of choice of access. Toby, you mentioned that there's other accesses. Anything different if you're going to use an impella, emergent impella to put a 5-0 in? Do you, any different technique from what we just saw here? So the, the only difference in an emergent situation is that you won't have the benefit of a CT necessarily to plan the procedure. Um, in a younger patient, for example, with fulminant myocarditis, that's probably the scenario in which emergent impella via transcable has been used. Um, to my knowledge, you know, that's typically younger patients with less calcium, and you can pretty much line things up in the cath lab using the two orthogonal views that we, we you know, they showed. Um, I think in a very elderly patient, um, for example, if you're planning an impeller-assisted complex uh, C, uh, you know, PCI, I would suggest getting a CT and planning it the, 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 the proper way. And sheath-wise, you just use whatever sheath you need just for the impeller, although you can also put your coronary guide catheters through it as well if necessary. If, you've, if you leave it the impeller, for example, 5-0 in for several days, can you still move the, to the, do the same closure device at the end, or do you have to yes. think about... Yes, I would consider using a slightly larger device because I wouldn't necessarily rely on the recoil of the aortic wall so much after a sheath has been in for a week or two. Well, in addition to calcification, do you have any uh, other factors to, to be considered when you are selecting the puncture site? For example, the distance between the uh, vena cava and the aorta distance, no? So we don't care about the distance. Okay. When we started, we said it, you can only do it if it's less than two centimeters. Then, of course, someone did a case with a distance of three centimeters and showed that it was fine. So we don't even measure it anymore. The key things we look for on the CT other than just access is we look to make sure that our axis is far enough away from the renals, far enough away from the bifurcation. If we have to put a covered stent in, we're not going to jeopardize renal flow or run off to the legs. And we also look, and Ronak showed you, we look at the, um, the mesenteric vessels as well. Because if we end up stenting across the IMA, we want to know that the celiac and the SMA are patent. So, you know, we, we really plan these very carefully to make sure that if we have to bail out, we know exactly what we're doing and that we're not going to cause another problem in the, in the process. Jafar and, and Toby. Well, while while sorry, you're on that point, Toby, it's for us, for the cases that we've done, just to, just let me say this very quickly, that uh, Ronak has done the very detailed CT analysis and then has sent it off to Toby, Jafar and Rob, who have verified, you know, that we've got it right. So a lot of planning goes in advance uh, of doing these cases. They're really not just off the cuff. 
Yeah, I think, I think like any new procedure, proctorship is always useful in the cath lab, but it's certainly, I think Ronat will attest that it's proctorship with the CT reading and the CT analysis is, is really I, I mean, absolutely. Well. The CT planning for a transcable yeah. procedure is very distinctly different to planning for a standard transfemoral transcatheter aortic valve replacement. It requires an intricate knowledge not only of the angles, but also of the procedure. So for the first couple of cases of the transcable procedure, I've been visiting the cardiac cath lab to understand these various steps. So you can provide the best image plan for your interventional operators. So it is quite a, a distinct plan that you have to devise to make sure that not only the procedure is feasible, that it is safe, and also that there is an appropriate bailout strategy. Okay. Yeah, we've pretty much come to the end of the session, so let me close the session. Um, from the main arena, uh, Simon, Bernard, Jafar, we want to congratulate you. I think we all got to see really a step-by-step -step transcable procedure.